Athletes today are speaking up about mental health struggles like never before, which is a good thing. Getting rid of the stigma associated with mental illness is a noble goal. All too often, athletes are coached to keep their emotions in check and to suck it up, whether it's a sore elbow or depression that hits like a hammer. Very few baseball players, however, are on the list of athletes who've opened up about mental illness, which is odd because in no sport does failure play such a huge role. Even the best baseball hitters will fail 7 out of 10 times, which really has no analog in other sports. A quarterback who connects 30% of the time? No. A tennis player who pumps in 30% of first serves? Definitely not. NBA players who shoot 30% from the field? Unless you're Shaq, no way. That kind of failure will end a career in most sports. In MLB, you might still make the Hall of Fame. So, failure in baseball have a long and painful history, and if any sport should have its share of stars opening up about the psychological turmoil of intense competition, it would be MLB. But as we'll see, for some players, baseball has a different dynamic at work that confounds easy analysis. The top three mental issues that elite athletes have cited are depression, anxiety, and stress. All three seem like they'd be at home in the head of a backup shortstop whose batting average sits the Mendoza line. Hitting 200 is depressing, facing Garrett Cole can cause anxiety, and the grind of 162 games is quite stressful. Getting sent down to the minors, and then back to the bigs, and then down again. Baseball players have a lot of emotional baggage to carry during the season. That's not to say players like Ryan Sheriff haven't been public in their battles with mental illness. Sheriff was a marginal reliever when he stepped away from the game in 2021 to deal with stress and anxiety. Or Daniel Bard, who we'll talk about in a bit, who stepped away from organized baseball altogether for years, and in that time talked extensively of the anxiety he had faced. But the sad reality is, despite the stress and pressure, elite athletes are still paid to perform, even when they are struggling. Maybe one day the effects of the stress caused from this will be addressed at the highest levels, and let's hope it's soon. But baseball history shows us another side to this story. But before we get more into the complicated nature of the yips, let me first tell you about today's sponsor, DraftKings. With the MLB season now in full swing, DraftKings allows you to get personally involved in the action of every game, with some of their best features making the world of sports betting so much more engaging, including their same game parlays feature, which allows you to combine multiple bets from the same game into one big bet for a chance at an even bigger payout. And now, using promo code MTC, new customers can bet just $5 in any wager and receive $100 fifty dollars in bonus bets instantly and hey if you're a fan of hockey or basketball both of the playoffs are going on for that right now so it's the perfect time to sign up get in on the action of your favorite sports today by downloading DraftKings Sportsbook at the link in my description or pinned comment and then using code MTC for five dollar wagers and hundred and fifty dollars in bonus bets and don't worry if sports betting isn't legal in your state yet you can still get in on the fun with DraftKings Daily Fantasy where they offer cash prize contests for nearly every sport thank you to DraftKings for sponsoring this video now back to the yips. Baseball players can come down with a debilitating condition that doesn't really have a name, a cause, or a cure, and it's usually brought on by extreme stress. For some players, something which on the surface seems random rises up and robs them of the basic ability to execute even the most common functions of their sport. It can strike any time and end a career in the blink of an eye. In golf, it's called the yips, which is technically the term for choking on easy punts. And while the yips can cost a golfer some money, it doesn't necessarily spell the end of their career. It's seen as more common after all, and thoroughly treatable. In baseball though, it's more like the mind has robbed the body of some essential muscle memory that may or may not come back. So let's take a look at the lineup of players who fought against this mysterious ailment, and maybe try to get a sense of something that seems unexplainable in its very nature. I mean, the yips is a funny thing. I mean, imagine something as simple as walking becoming something where you had to literally think of the angle of your knee, the, the pressure you're putting into the ground on every step. That's exactly what throwing became for me. Daniel Bard. The World Baseball Classic was a smashing success, except for a few notable injuries. One was to Edwin Diaz during a post-game celebration that still to this day seems almost surreal, and the other was to Jose Altuve, whose thumb was broken by a hit by pitch. On the surface, this seems like an obvious case of a guy with a demon sinker losing control for a brief instant, plunking one of baseball's biggest stars in an unfortunate location, but there was more to it than meets the eye. The pitcher who fired the beanball was Daniel Bard, who has been, in many ways, as broken as El Tuve's thumb in the past. That Bard was even on the mound for Team USA was something of a miracle, because Daniel's preceding story seems more like the stuff of Hollywood than of the diamond. 
Daniel Bard was a first round pick for the Boston Red Sox in 2006 out of the University of North Carolina. His 100 mile per hour fastball and wicked slider led many to believe he had a future as a number one, number two starter in the bigs. However, by 2017, he was getting shelled in the Texas League with the Springfield Cardinals, the fifth organization that had tried to figure out what had gone wrong with Bard's once promising career. And promising it was. Bard began with the Red Sox as a starter, but was pretty awful even with that crazy stuff, as he had an ERA over seven while averaging over one walk per inning in his early minor league days. The Red Sox, though, turned him into a reliever, and in 2008, he was their minor league pitcher of the year. By 2009, Bard was in the big leagues to stay, and for the next three seasons, he put up strong numbers. His ERA plus over that span averaged 162, and he struck out more than a batter per inning. He was the consummate setup eighth inning arm, at least until September 2011, in which both he and the Red Sox began a horrible stretch where they lost 20 out of 27 games to go from first place to last, with Bard doing his part by going 0-4 with an ERA over 10 and three blown saves. His control was off, and as bad as it was, things were going to get much, much worse. For most of 2011, his control was decent, with about three walks per nine innings. By the next season, Bard averaged six and a half walks per nine. The Red Sox had returned him to starting, and all Bard did was fill the bases with runners. His whip was over 1.7. He got sent back to AAA for the first time in nearly half a decade, and walked even more hitters there. He couldn't throw the ball where he wanted it to go, and at times, it almost seemed like it was slinging out of that right arm completely independent of his own thoughts. By 2013, he was back in AA, with even worse results, 27 walks in 15 innings. The Sox DFA'd him, and so did five other organizations between 2013 and 2017. Bard knew he had the yips, and tried everything to fix the problem. Mechanical adjustments, hypnotism, weight lifting, guzzling beers before bullpens, and even a brief stint as a sidearm pitcher. But nothing worked. He was done by 2017, defeated by something that had emerged overnight, robbing him of his star power without solution. He took a job with the Diamondbacks as a mental skills coach and mentor, and while playing catch over the next two seasons, felt something strange happen. He started being able to throw a baseball with some semblance of control. He felt his joy for the sport return again, and was told by staff members and players alike to grab his cleats and get back on the mound. After all, when you're throwing 96 with movement, MLB teams will take notice. And so, as quickly as the yips had come over him, it seemed they had ceased their grip on his career, and things got much better for him very quickly. By 2020, he was back in the bigs to stay with the Colorado Rockies. Not just holding on, mind you, but flourishing once again, saving 60 games over three seasons. The power was back too, with him averaging over a strikeout per inning, and his walk rate was down to his more normal levels of around 3.5 per 9. He signed a two-year, $19 million extension during the 2022 season, when Bard put up a ridiculous ERA plus of 262. He'd cured his yips, except the same mental issues that had troubled him for over a decade came back in spring training, and the Rockies decided to put him on the 15-day IL before the season even began with anxiety. While he has come back since to the tune of just one run allowed in nine innings, his story serves as a landmark example of how fast the yips can bring you down, before letting you go only to grab you again. Let's hope they're finally behind him at this point. Chuck Knobloch. The yips seem to strike when a player is at the top, more than likely due to the increased pressures associated. Bard, after all, was one of the best relief pitchers in baseball when he suddenly lost his ability to throw strikes. And Chuck Knobloch, our second example, was one of the best second basemen in the game when he seemingly forgot how to execute the most routine throws to first base possible. Knobloch took MLB by storm, breaking in with the Twins in 1991, winning Rookie of the Year honors by hitting 281, swiping 25 bases, and knocking 24 doubles. The Twins won the World Series, with Chuck having established himself as a true rising star in the game. After committing 18 errors in his first season, Knobloch became a dependable fielder. For example, in 1996, Knobloch played 151 games at second base and committed just 8. The next season, he won a gold glove for his defensive prowess. I do want to say here that errors are a bad way to judge a fielder, but being as this was a completely different time, we don't have the data to accurately evaluate defensive play nearly as well as we do today, so it's kind of what we're left with. 1998 brought a trade to the biggest team in the sport at the time, the Yankees, and at some point, for some reason, one of the best second basemen in the game would find himself unable to field his position. His first season saw him commit 13 errors, the most since his rookie campaign. The bottom didn't truly fall out though until the 1999 season, when he made 26. Mostly, they were on routine throws to first, which Nublock had done tens of thousands of times since his childhood. The Gold Glover kept spraying the ball like he was wearing a blindfold and guessing where the bag was. He tried lobbing it over, firing it over, it didn't matter. The Yips had claimed themselves another victim. 
The lowest point of Knobloch's descent came in 2000 in a game against the White Sox when he made three errors in six innings, all on throws. Knobloch asked to be taken out of the game and proceeded to depart Yankee Stadium entirely before the contest was even over. Two days later, Knobloch misfired again to first, with the ball careening into the stands, hitting a female spectator who just so happened to also be broadcaster Keith Oberman's mother. She wasn't seriously injured, thank goodness. After 2000, Knobloch never played another game at second base in the big leagues. The Yankees moved him to the outfield instead, where he improved somewhat, with Chuck being a big part of the three-peat World Series run the team proceeded to go on. But the 1999 season would be the last one where Knobloch had an OPS plus over 100, and now, as an outfielder, this made him more of a liability than anything else. He was basically a below-average player by the 2000 season, and by 2002, at just 33 years old, he was out of baseball entirely after a disappointing season with the Royals. The Yips can take on many forms as well. Sometimes it's a complete shutdown, like in the case of Daniel Bard and Chuck Knobloch. But then there's more eclectic cases, like the ordeal of John Lester, whose case was wholly unique to his own game. Looking at Lester's career, it's hard to see where the Yips did him any real damage. He pitched for 16 years in the MLB, winning 200 games with a 117 ERA+. Plus. He went to the postseason seven times and won three rings, going 4-1 and one in the World Series, being the true embodiment of a big game pitcher. But it was during the course of this immensely impressive big league career that something strange happened. John Lester lost the ability to throw to the bases, any of them, except for home plate. While pitching, Lester could put the ball wherever he wanted, notching an excellent walks per nine mark of just 2.9. But if the batter bunted a ball back to him, then all of a sudden he couldn't hit the side of a barn. Lester won't say how his version of the yips began. One theory is that it started in 2007, during Game 4 of the ALCS, when Lester threw a pickoff down the right field line. Regardless, by 2009, Boston coaches were noticing how reluctant Lester was to throw over to first. In 2010, some think that Lester spent a huge portion of the offseason working to fix his yips, and for some unknown reason, this only succeeded in making the situation worse. At the time, manager Terry Francona decided that, after watching Lester struggle all year with throwing over, it was pointless to keep trying, and so the bench stopped calling for pickoffs entirely. That strategy pretty much stayed with Lester for the rest of his playing days. In 2014, for example, he made no pickoff attempts. Zero. Zilch. And it didn't seem to matter, because even though opposing teams knew he couldn't and wouldn't throw over, few were actually willing to run wildly on him. Part of this was obviously because of the catchers he was throwing to. David Ross, Wilson Contreras, and AJ Pierzynski all had their own ways of keeping the running game at bay, and helped prevent the situation from getting truly out of control. One of these ways was through back picks, which the Cubs, the team he ended up spending the majority of his career with after this point, prided themselves on. They basically said, go ahead and get your massive lead, but if you do, you better be going, or we'll just pick you off a different way. Lester was also decently fast at the plate, helping his backstops out whenever they actually had to make throws to the bases. I'm not saying it worked all of the time, however. He still routinely allowed the most steals in baseball as a pitcher, but again, not at the crazy rates that might have been without these tricks. Lester never did fix his yips. In practice, he could always nail a throw to the bag. On the field, in real time, it was a different story. You want to know how absolute the no-throw-over rule became? In the 2016 World Series, when Lester came on in Game 4 with the runner at first, with the season on the line, he still refused to throw over to keep the runner close. If he fielded a bunt, his preferred method was running to first base and then making an underhanded throw. Twice, he threw his entire glove with the ball in it to first base. When he was forced to make longer tosses, he would fire the ball into the ground, trying to outright bounce it over there. Whatever gets the job done was pretty much Lester's mantra when it came to fielding, and it served him well. He never got over the yips, but they never truly got to him either. The situation with Rick Ankeel is far different. The yips hit him like a truck, but Ankeel, in response, echoed the sentiment of the ancient Chinese proverb, when a door closes, a window opens. Let's go back to the 1997 draft. There was one pitcher who was hands down the best of the crop, a high schooler from Port St. Lucie named Rick Ankeel, who'd struck out 162 batters in just 74 innings during his senior year. Scouts drooled over the mid-90s fastball and the sharp breaking curveball. He was almost major league ready by his senior season, and by 1999, when he was just 19 years old, Ankeel debuted in the show. As he later wrote, greatness was his destiny. He just had to be the second coming of Steve Carlton or Sandy Koufax. His rookie season proved the scouts right, and Keel, despite being the second youngest player in the league, finished the season 11-7 with a 3.50 ERA, but perhaps even more impressive were his rate stats, 194 Ks in just 175 innings, one of the best marks ever recorded for a rookie at that time. He also gave up only 7 hits per 9 innings. In the 2000 NLCS against the Braves, Ankeel was tagged to start Game 1 against the legendary Greg Maddox. It was during this game that Rick Ankeel's destiny took a serious detour. 
Scientists don't understand why the yips develop. The technical term for it is task-specific dystonia, meaning that's not purely psychological, nor is it purely physical, but some confounding combination of brain and body getting askew. And Rick was about to get about as askew as it gets. It started off with a walk to the pitcher, Maddox, and then an infield pop-up, with Andrew Jones at the plate and Keel overthrew a curveball that went to the backstop and Keel's career would never be the same after that one pitch. It was as if all the hard work, the blood, the sweat, the tears had vanished. In total, and Keel would uncork five wild pitches during the inning, most of them fastballs that sailed like cruise missiles towards the backstop or into the ground like grenades. No pitcher had thrown five wild pitches in an inning since 1890. Things hadn't cleared up by the next season, so it was determined that Ankiel would be sent all the way down to single A to straighten his mechanics out, the lowest pressure environment possible. It didn't work. His control issues, if you can even call a complete lack of control issues, persisted, and then he ran into elbow troubles. He would only make one more appearance for the Cardinals at the big league level, in 2004, winning his only start of the season. It was too much for him, and Keel told the Cardinals he was retiring, that the stress of pitching and the yips was eating him alive. This didn't last long, thank goodness, as Rick would instead take to the outfield, a place where he seemingly had no trouble throwing strikes. He returned to the bigs in 2007, and in his first game as a full-time outfielder, and Keel homered. He'd go on to hit 75 more during his second coming, to go with a 240 batting average and a career OPS plus of 92. But most impressively, he made legendary throw after legendary throw, establishing himself as having one of the best outfield arms in baseball history. Today, there are only two players that have ever pitched at least 20 innings and hit at least 25 home runs in a season while both starting a playoff game and homering in a playoff game in their careers. Babe Ruth and Rick and Keel. Mark Wohlers. Mark Wohlers broke in in 1991, and at the time, his triple-digit velo out of the pen made him something of a notorious figure. Nolan Ryan and Randy Johnson were the kings of velocity, but they were starters. Wohlers had been a starter in the Braves organization, but he'd been a bust in that role. Typical was his single-A season in Sumter. 2-7 with an ERA of 6.49 and 58 walks in just 68 innings. The Braves, being the Braves of the 1990s, did the smart thing and moved Wallers to the bullpen, where his career really took off. The next time Wallers pitched in Sumter, he was a closer, and he struck out 85 in 52 innings with an ERA of 1.88. Between 1991 and 1993, Wohlers bounced between Atlanta and Richmond, mostly because the Braves wanted Wohlers to cut down on the walks and improve his command. He was included on the postseason roster for the 1991 and 1992 World Series and pitched well enough. In 1993, the Phillies took him deep twice in the NLCS, but Wohlers redeemed himself two years later when he was the Braves' primary closer and he shut down the Indians in the World Series, saving two games as Atlanta finally won a ring after many near misses. Over the next three seasons, Wohlers saved 77 games. In 1997, he saved 33 and struck out 92 in 68 innings, a rate at which few others had come close to at the time. However, his walks per nine innings doubled from the previous year, from 2.4 to 4.9, and his ERA Plus fell under 100. This was a sign of things to come. It was in the 1998 season that Wohlers completely lost his ability to locate his fastball. In the 27 games he pitched, Wohlers averaged 14.6 walks per 9 innings. The Braves sent him back to Richmond, where he could try to regain his form. No luck. He was even worse in AAA, where his ERA was over 20, and so was his walks per 9 innings. Numbers as bad as that are rarely seen at any level of pro ball, much less from one of the game's previously most feared closers. Wolders hung around for parts of five more seasons, enduring two Tommy John surgeries. In 2002, he saved seven games for the Indians, but by 2003, he was in Akron, and after two games, he hung it up for good. He'd tried therapy, he'd tried visualization techniques, he'd watched hours of film from when he was dominating, but unfortunately, nothing seemed to work. Another promising talent lost to the baseball gods. The yips have no known cause and no known cure. One day you can be dominant on top of your game, and the next, you're at a loss, unable to do the one thing you've excelled at your whole life. If the yips were purely psychological, then therapy should help, but sadly, that doesn't seem to be the case. If the yips were purely physical, then coaches and biometrics should fix it. They don't either. After all, Wohlers had a pitching coach in Richmond, Bill Fisher, who still holds the record for the most consecutive innings pitched without issuing a walk, 84 and a third. Even he couldn't seem to help. Let's hope that one day we can figure out exactly how to solve this perplexing condition and potentially save many future careers in the process. Thanks for watching everyone, like and subscribe if you enjoyed, and check out this playlist for more essay content just like this. Have a great day.